Welcome to the Connor's Corner segment of Ask the Lawyer. You know, on this show, obviously, we, we spend a lot of time talking about the Civil War, and we spend spend an enormous amount of time talking about Robert E. Lee. Today, we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to be talking about the father of Robert E. Lee, and our guest is Ryan Cole. Welcome to Connor's Corner. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Ryan, who is the father of Robert E. Lee? His name was Henry Lee III. He was a member of one of Virginia's first families. He was a hero of the American Revolution. He was a statesman in the early years of the Republic. He led the federal forces into western Pennsylvania to do the Whiskey Rebellion. He eulogized George Washington as first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of his countrymen. He was one of Washington's protégés. He was a com- comrade of Alexander Hamilton, a classmate of James Madison and Thomas Jefferson's arch nemesis. So he was a founding father, and he was Robert E. Lee's father. All right, let's we'll start with his military career first. How did he get involved in the, in the Revolutionary War and, and in the military? Okay, well, he originally graduated from the College of New Jersey, which is now Princeton, and he originally intended to go to England to study the law, but uh, this was 1773-74. This was not the war and revolution intervened. It didn't happen, so he chose uh, another path, and that was fighting in the Revolution. He'd known George Washington since childhood, and he actually had a dinner at Mount Vernon with George Washington and Charles Lee shortly before Washington departed for Philadelphia, and it fired his imagination. He decided to become a soldier, and he went from doing militia work around Prince William County, was where he was from. Uh, then when Virginia raised cavalry, he was part of that. And then when that was folded into the larger Continental Army, he fought in the Northern Theater with Washington. And then at the end of the war, he was dispatched to join Nathaniel Green in the southern states and the strategy that eventually led to Yorktown and at the end of the day, American independence. Now, we're going to take a small detour right now. You said he met with George Washington and Charles Lee. Who was Charles Lee? Was he any relation? Charles Lee, no, he was no relation, but it's, there are so many Lees, it's confusing. But Charles Lee was a very eccentric soldier of for, fortune from Great Britain who had hopes to be the leader of the American army and was resented George Washington and is remembered in history because he preferred the company of dogs to humans. I know a lot of people, though, right now who prefer the company of dogs to humans. So I don't know. Maybe he made a comeback. That's one of the more admirable traits. You uh, know. Getting back to Harry Lee, he, he's not a great general. He's more of a cavalry leader. What What are some of his accomplishments during the war, Revolutionary during the War? Well, the things that he accomplished, you're not going to be talking about the big battles necessarily that we remember by name, but a lot of it is guerrilla warfare. That's how we would describe it as fighting between the armies, to raiding supply uh, trains, securing food or clothing for the American army during the winter at Valley Forge, uh, fighting with Hessians. But the one accomplishment that I can name for you is the the Battle of Pulse Hook. Pulse Hook was a a loyalist held fort jutting off the coast of New Jersey, and Lee designed a a raid on it, got Washington to sign off, and then executed it without losing a single life. And Congress actually awarded Lee a a gold medal for that accomplishment. He was the only soldier below the rank of general during the revolution to receive that medal. But I should point out, this is very typical of his life. He didn't actually ever get it. He was commissioned, but he was still trying to get it decades later. And why was that? Or just the inefficiency of Congress or inefficiency? It was inefficiency. Jefferson was originally, or Franklin was charged with, with getting the, the, coin struck. It didn't work out. Then Jefferson was. They had a model for it. The die broke. Like, and it just never happened. His son was still trying to find it for him years later. And I just thought, you know, I mean, we'll get into this, I think, but his life had a very tragic arc. And this was just an example of how cursed he was in some ways. This, this medal is a good metaphor. Revolutionary War, the war in the South, what was it like? It was brutal. It was a civil war. It was a lot of the British had hoped that pockets of loyalists would rise up and help their cause. Uh, so I say in the book that it was a civil war and brother was killing brother and Lee saw this and it actually pushed him away from civil war later when there was, during the early years of the Republic, when there were revolts against federal policies, Lee, even when he disliked them, always backed off from the idea of disunion because what he'd seen in the South, he was, I would describe him as Nathaniel Green's a special weapon in his strategy. He dispatched him and Francis Marion to tear through the interior of the southern states to recapture or disrupt the British communication line in a series of forts. And you really see Lee where his talent was. He could improvise on the fly. 
could figure out how to dislodge the British from these installations, just coming up with strategies. In one case, they shot flame-tipped arrows down into one of the forts to chase the British out. In another, they constructed a tower with trees they had felled, climbed up, and raked the British with fire and got them out. So you really see Lee in the South, his talents really come to fruition in terms of being able to plan on the fly and daring and ingenious strategy. How does it lead up to Yorktown, the, the strategy in the South? Well, the, the Green batters Cornwallis so much that he has to retreat to Yorktown, and he's trapped there and surrenders. And Lee is actually there. This is a really interesting story. Green sends Lee to Yorktown, not in any uh, not as a soldier, but as a messenger, because he wants Washington to concentrate on the remaining British pockets in the south after Yorktown. They still hold Charleston. And he sends Lee. So Lee is there observing the surrender at Yorktown. His friends, Hamilton, is there, who are actually participating, getting some of the glory. Well, Lee, who was already frustrated at the time about lack of recognition, uh, and he hadn't he hadn't won sufficient laurels yet in the in the revolution, and there he is, this climactic moment as a spectator. The war's over. What's what's next for Harry Lee? He goes home, and Nathaniel Green, in a series of back and forth letters, doesn't want Lee to leave. He leaves before just before the war ends. Lee is tired. He's frustrated. His ego is bruised. He's, Green says to Lee, "You'll go home. You'll marry. You'll become a farmer. But you cannot cease to be a soldier." And that turns out to be true. Goes home. He marries his second cousin, Matilda Lee who is the mistress of Stratford Hall, the Lee ancestral home on Virginia's northern neck. So by marrying her, he becomes the master of Stratford Hall and becomes a, a farmer or a planter. But he can't stay away from politics. He serves in the um, Congress of Confederation, where he's unhappy with uh, its ability to govern the nation. And he ends up part of the Virginia Ratifying Convention after the Constitution is conceived and lobbies along with James Madison, in behalf of ratification, helps carry the day in Richmond, which is hugely important because you need buy-in from Virginia, one of the most influential, um, most populous states in the new country. And it's really, you see Lee in his element. He's a really silver-tongued statesman, and he goes back and forth with Patrick Henry, who was you know, one of the grandees of Virginia's political scene, who is against the Constitution. It's, and you see him argue in favor of national unity, saying, I fought with my brothers in the North, and we are one country, and I will always be in matters local of Virginia, but all matters national, I will never forget I'm an American. What was his relationship with George Washington in this time period? He remained close to Washington. He had known Washington since he was a boy, because Washington was an associate of his father, Henry Lee II, and visited their home, Leesylvania. He corresponded with Washington frequently. They discussed politics. They strategized about ratifying the Constitution. They exchanged notes on farming. They exchanged gifts. Um, he fell out politically with Washington for a period because he was opposed to Hamilton's financial policies uh, in the early years of the Washington administration. But he remained close personally to Washington as well as Hamilton uh, throughout the remainder of Washington's life. And Washington thought enough of him that he, as I mentioned earlier, chose him to lead the federal forces into western Pennsylvania to, to put down the first real insurrection against the federal government in 1794. I think it's it's a good lesson to learn. What was the rebellion, the Whiskey Rebellion? What was that about? Farmers in the western states, particularly western Pennsylvania, were upset at Hamilton's policy, which had a tax, an excise tax. Now, these farmers... They lived far away from the centers of population. They were living amongst other farmers. They were excess crops. They didn't really have an opportunity to do anything with, so they would convert them into, for example, spirits. And they rebelled against this tax, which they felt was unfair. And they, um, there was an insurrection of sorts. It ended up being really, when the army marched in, there wasn't much more than some raggedly, raggedly closed farmers who were upset. But there were some real demonstrations. They chased out tax collectors. And Washington and Hamilton in particular saw this as a, the first real threat against their government, and they realized that it had to be stamped out. And I think Washington, as, as was his, you know, as always, realized it had to be done gently. And the army going into the to western Pennsylvania had to treat those who had encountered kindly and charitably. But Hamilton was a little more energetic about it. And it falls on Lee to ultimately march that army into Pittsburgh. Is that the end of his military career? That is the end of his military career. There's talk and commissions. 
you know, in the coming years when it looks like the United States may go to war again, by the time of the war of 1812, he is incapable of ha- taking any type of command. His health is so diminished and his reputation is also in tatters because of bad uh, financial planning. But that dr- draws the curtain on his military career. You started to get into it, bad financial planning. How? Mm-hmm. That, that what happened? Be, that's a... Okay, the bad, bad financial plan is kind of a modern way of describe it. He mm-hmm. suffered from an, an addiction that many of his generation did, and that was you have a new country and you have a population that's going to move west as roads are built and rivers become passable and canals are constructed. And the thought is you buy this land cheaply at the beginning of this process, and as everything starts moving west onto this land, it, it acquires value. And Lee started gobbling it up immediately after he um, leaves the army. And he doesn't have a real head for business. He has more enthusiasm than actual acumen. And he ends up buying land, going into debt, uh, purchasing, selling. In some cases, a great story you asked about George Washington. In one case, he traded George Washington some parcels of land for a stallion one of Washington's magnificent stallions. And it turns out Lee had already promised that land to someone else. So he had to apologize to Washington. It was embarrassing. But by the time of the uh, the, the 19th century dawns, he's so badly in debt, he basically is in hiding on the run from his creditors or desperately trying to scrounge up the money. Like I said, it wasn't uncommon. You know, Robert Morris, who was the financier of the revolution, suffered the same fate and actually owed Lee money. And Lee believed that if he'd been able to recoup that money, he would have stayed out of debtor's prison, which is where he eventually ends up at the end of all this wild speculation. Debtor's prison. You know, in the 21st century, I don't think we know what that is. What was it? He had a choice. He could declare bankruptcy or he could serve time uh, in prison to please all his creditors. And that's what he ended up doing. And the irony of, you know, Robert Morse did the same thing. James Wilson, who was the kind of intellectual leader of the revolution in some ways, suffered the same fate, also owed Lee money. But the upshot of Lee going to debtor's prison was that he found the strength to write his memoirs while he was there, which are still amongst the most colorful and most compelling um, chronicle of the Southern campaign, the American Revolution. Now, obviously, he started a family while this was going on. How many children yeah. did he have? Well, he living, he, he, first of all, I have to get into the wife because there's more than one wife. He married Matilda Lee, who was the, I mentioned her earlier, I believe, who was the yes. heiress to Stratford Hall. She died in 1790. They had, um, they had surviving, they had a son, Philip Ludwell who was the heir, the oldest son, who dies while Lee is governor of Virginia, Lucy Lee, who lives, Henry Lee IV, who also lives, and there was another child, Nathaniel Green Lee, named after Nathaniel Green, who dies. So then he remarries Ann Carter, who's another uh, member of one of Virginia's foremost families. And they have um, Algernon Sidney, who dies as a child, Charles Carter Lee, and Sidney Smith, then Robert, and the last child is Mildred. So, okay, Robert E. Lee. What was the relationship between Robert E. Lee and his father? There wasn't much of one. And the problem is Robert was born in 1807. This is in the midst of Lee's crisis, financial crisis. So Lee is very rarely at home. In fact, uh, he's not at home when Robert is born. And he's either for the rest of the time that that their lives intersect. Harry is either on the run, in jail, or, and I guess we can get to this next, is he spent the last few years of his life in exile in the West Indies. So Robert would have barely known his father, and historians for years have tried to figure out what impact this absentee father with this disgrace, but also glorious reputation, what impact it had on Robert, his career, and his own personal life. He's in exile in the West Indies. Why? He gets pummeled by a mob in Baltimore the onset of the War of 1812. He defends a Federalist newspaper editor who is opposed to the war and attacks the Madison administration. So he gets pummeled. His head is described as black and swollen. There's a hole where his eye once was. His nose is split in half and hot candle wax is poured in his eyes. He does survive this, but his health is so shot, his finances are still a wreck, and he thinks if he can get to a warmer climate, it might restore his health to some degree. So he asks his old friend James Madison to let him pass through the blockade of Chesapeake Bay. We're at war, remember, with the British. And he makes his way to the West Indies, where he spends the last years of his life wandering. He's destitute. He's reliant on the kindness of strangers or the gullibility of strangers. 
And he carries a diary with him, which I'll talk about quite a bit in the book, where he records his experiences, his feelings, his hopes for his sons, observations on modern politics and ancient politics. And he finally, in 1818, decides that he's going to come home. He swindles an old widow to help him pay his debts, and he gets passage on a boat. And as he's passing up around the coast of Georgia, realizes that he's near Cumberland Island, which is where Nathaniel Green's widow built a home and where their daughter lives. And he decides he wants to disembark and go to the house and die in the home of his old general. And that's exactly what he does in March of 1818. All right, here we are, you know, 200 years later. Why is is Harry Lee important? Why are you writing about him? He's important for a number of reasons. He's important because his, his contributions during the war on the battlefield, he helped us win our independence militarily. He's important for his role as a statesman in the years after that. He, By helping Virginia ratify the Constitution, he helped give us the form of government we have now. He's important because he eulogized George Washington as first in war, first in peace, and first in the hearts of countrymen. We still, that phrase is still quoted. We still remember Washington is exactly that. He's also important because he, as we talked about, his role in subduing the Whiskey Rebellion. He's important as well because of the, his memoirs about the The Southern campaigns, which are still, I think, in a lot of ways definitive, although you could argue that they uh, he makes he aggrandizes his own role, perhaps a touch. But that's just keeping up with his personality. He's an important member of the founding generation. And even more than that, the reason I wrote the book, not only because I find that he's relevant, significant and played a part in the formation of our country, but his life amongst that generation is so human and so compelling with so many twists and turns. As I said, Hamilton's life made a beloved musical, but Lee's would make a tragic opera. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that some of the founding fathers didn't, it wasn't always a happy ending. No, no. And you really, you know, we've got, we're at a point now where we don't like heroes. We're not really into heroes. We like tearing them down. But I look at Lee and I really see a human, and I find that compelling. And a man who heroic qualities with, with some real flaws co-mingle. And that's, it was very compelling to spend a few years with him, learning about him, and and I hope that people will be as compelled by his story as I was. Okay, the name of the book, Light Horse Harry Lee, The Rise and Fall of a Revolutionary Hero. Ryan Cole, thank you That's for right. bringing history to life. Thank, thanks for having me.